Thank you, Dean, take it away. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I would like to um, recognize the, the library and their partnership in the Winter Perspective series and all of their help in making um, these presentations available to the public. My name is Dean Butterworth. I'm the Outreach and Education Specialist at Olympic National Park, and I use he, him pronouns, and we're really excited um, to be offering the Winter Perspective Series um, again this year. And um, we are, we recognize that um, we're still on Zoom, um, and there is advantages and disadvantages to this medium. Um, and we will be revisiting um, whether or not we'll be on Zoom um, for not this series, but for the next year's series. Um, but there's some advantages, one of which is uh, we get to have presenters join us from all over um, the country, um, that's, which is a lot easier than when we do in-person meetings. And I do understand that we've all been on Zoom quite a lot over the last two and a half years. Um, so uh, thanks for bearing with us um, and thank you for joining us tonight. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Kim Sager Fratkin, who is the um, Wildlife Program Manager at the Lower Elaklalem Tribe. Um, and I will let Kim introduce herself and her program. And uh, just to reiterate, uh, you can go ahead and type your questions in the chat or you can um, keep your questions to the end of Kim's presentation and then we'll open it up for uh, questions at that time. So I will turn the time over to Kim with much gratitude. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean. Um, can you hear me, Dean, and see my slides? Yes, I can hear you and I can see a beautiful cougar looking back over its shoulder at me. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, hi everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, uh, another benefit of being on Zoom is that sick presenters are able to present. Um, I have to ask for forgiveness for my voice. I have been homesick for uh, four days and just trying to, um, it's just a cold. I went to the doctor today. Anyway, I just have a cold, but I'm not feeling up to my normal snuff. So if I'm, my voice catches a little bit, that's why. Um, but I'm glad I'm not in person with all of you for that reason. I would have had to cancel. So thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Kim Sager Fradkin. I am the Wildlife Program Manager at the Lower Elwha Clallam Tribe. I have worked with wildlife on the Olympic Peninsula uh, since 1998. So quite a long time, um, most of my adult life. And I have been at the tribe since 2007, um, working on a huge variety of species and just have been so fortunate to be there, working on everything from deer to elk to cougars to uh, everything related to Elwha restoration. But tonight, I'm going to talk to you specifically about the Olympic Cougar Project. And I hope that you all enjoy the presentation. And please feel free to ask questions in the chat box and we'll try to get to those at the end. So the Olympic Cougar Project is a large collaborative project. Um, it was originally started in 2018 with a grant to the Lower Elwha Clallam Tribe. Uh, we very quickly uh, started to work with Panthera, a large cat research and conservation organization out of New York and Dr. Mark Elbrock, uh, is the, the Puma lead at Panthera. And just to get this out there right, right away, Pumas, mountain lions, cougars, Florida panther, they are all the same animal, all the same species. Um, Pumas, what we call cougars, run the entire Americas from the tip of South America to North America, um, but they do only live in the Americas. So they have many different names. Um, but here on the Olympic Peninsula, we call them cougars. Anyway, Mark, Dr. Mark Elbrock with Panthera is the Puma, Puma program lead there. And we quickly teamed up um, in about 2019 and then quickly grew 
the project to include other tribes. So now we are a peninsula-wide project. We include the Skokomish Indian tribe, the Macaw Indian Nation, um, the Point No Point Treaty Council, which covers Jamestown and Port Gamble's Glallam tribes, um, and the Quinault Nation. We also work with the University of Idaho, and much of our funding comes from the Administration for Native Americans. And my slides won't advance here. So let's see here. Worked when I was practicing earlier. You're still seeing the same slide, Dean? Yes, I'm still seeing the Olympic Cougar project with all of your uh, partners. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing for a second. Um, we went through this. This is always how it happens, isn't it? You test it. It was fine when we tested. <laughs> okay, I'm going to get down a few slides here and see if I can make this work again. All right, bear with me, everybody. Sorry about this. Let's see here. All right, hold on. What are you seeing now, Dean? I'm seeing your um, the PowerPoint, but not the presenter mode, just okay, the right. edit mode. Yeah. Okay. Give me a second here. It's doing something funny. Okay. There we go. Okay. I'm going to try this again. Oh, gosh. So I'm I'm seeing your PowerPoint in the edit mode. Yeah. Okay, let's try it again. Yep. Okay, now we're moved forward. Now yes, you're seeing there we now. Go. Okay, I'm seeing the tribal tribal treaty areas. Okay. okay, sorry about that snafu. Let's hope it doesn't happen again. All right, so the Olympic Cougar Project um, covers three primary tribal treaty areas: um, the Treaty of No. Point No Point, the Treaty of Quinault River, and the Treaty of Nia Bay. And why are we talking about treaty areas? And why are the tribes even interested in studying mountain lions? Um, the first is, well, that the tribes have important treaty relationships with the federal government. And all of the tribes of the Olympic Cougar Project signed treaties in 1855 and 1856, which began their federally recognized relationship with the US government. And in those treaties, the tribes retained many rights, um, and primary among them from our perspective is to hunt and, um, on open and unclaimed lands, which is a can of worms because what was open and unclaimed in 1855 and 56 is not still the case, um, but that is another topic. Um, the tribes also retained the right to regulate the hunting activities of tribal members and to manage wildlife resources in their traditional use areas. And this is a responsibility that tribes now share with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And among the important um, aspects of treaty relationships is that tribes uh, participate in subsistence harvest. And the tribes of the Olympic Cougar Project have a shared long-term community goal of monitoring and managing wildlife populations and preserving intact wildlife habitats for the benefit of the next seven generations for subsistence harvest purposes and for the greater ecological health of our shared regional landscape. So because of this important shared goal, the tribes joined together really for the first time ever. We have never worked together in the way that we are working together right now. Um, and so we began working together to pursue these shared goals and re have received multiple grants to help us pursue our goals. Um, from 2018 to 2020, we were funded by the Administration for Native Americans. We got another ANA grant that we are working under right now um, that came to a bunch of the tribes together. We have also received several US Fish and Wildlife Service tribal wildlife grants 
and a lot of funding from Panthera. So many, many funding sources have made this research possible. So the Olympic Cougar Project has three primary goals that I'm going to talk about tonight. The first is to calculate a population estimate of cougars and bobcats for a portion of the North Olympic Peninsula. Uh, the second is to establish and maintain a grid of cameras to document the presence of cougars and other wildlife across our shared inner tribal landscape. And then finally, to examine cougar movements, home range, diet, and sub-adult dispersal patterns. So we're first going to talk about goal number one. How on earth do you count cougars and bobcats? Uh, when we talk about historic work that we've done on elk and deer, we often fly in helicopters. We can count things from helicopters, but we cannot count cougars from helicopters. Um, and you cannot just drive around on forest roads and hope to see some and count them. Um, and so how do we do it? Well, we actually use genetics and dogs. So we work with SCAT detection dogs, a group called Rogue Detection Teams, and they have dogs that are trained specifically on the SCAT of various species. They also can find human remains or bat hibernacula or you know, larvae of certain species. So these dogs are trained on multiple different species, but we had dogs here that were specifically trained on uh, cougar and bobcat scat. And these are dogs that are otherwise in a lot of ways untrainable. These are dogs that are often left at the pound because they're very challenging pets. They have an incredible drive and they have an incredible drive towards balls. <laughs> and so these dogs are trained for conservation purposes and they go out in the field and when they find a scat of the species of interest on the ground, they stand and they point at the scat. The handler comes over, collects the scat, uh, and then the dog is rewarded with three minutes of tennis ball play. Uh, we are working with Cameron Macias, who is a Lower Elwha Clallam tribal member and longtime employee of our program. Um, and Cameron is now working on a PhD at the University of Idaho. Uh, doing genetic work from this cougar and bobcat scat. So of the scats we collected, she takes it back to the lab and she gets genetic information um, and is able to come up with information about the cougar and bobcat populations on the Pisht Game Management Unit study area of the North Olympic Peninsula. So the Pisht GMU generally runs from the Elwha River west to Clallam, Bay and north of Highway 101. From 2018 to um, 2020, we collected, or the, or the dogs collected and handlers, 168 individual cougar scats across the landscape. Um, Cameron has done the first round of analysis and identified 24 unique individuals from their scat. This does not mean that there are 24 cougars on um, the Pisht Game Management Unit. This is a minimum number, and she is still working on deriving the population estimates. Interestingly, as you'll see later, we have radio collared a lot of mountain lions um, on the peninsula. And ultimately, of the 168 scats and the 24 identified individuals, 12 of those, so half of them, are cougars that are known to us. And some animals we saw in multiple years, we saw their scat in multiple years, um, some only in one or two years. So it's pretty neat to have sort of our, the scat data overlaid with some of our GPS data. And you'll learn a little bit more about the GPS data later. So she's actively working on those population estimates um, and we're doing that for cougars and bobcats. Um, our second primary goal is to establish and maintain a grid of cameras to document the presence of cougars and other wildlife across the landscape. Uh, so again, historically, we used a lot of helicopters on the Olympic Peninsula to count wildlife. And we really want to use something that is safer for the biologist, uh, less cost intensive, and less invasive to count animals. So our goal um, has been to deploy 400 or more cameras, and we're really at well over 400, per year across over 2,000 square miles on the Olympic Peninsula. And then to develop a photo database for six culturally important wildlife species, 
inclusive of elk, cougar, black bear, bobcat, and coyote, and their key habitats. So the beautiful thing about cameras is that we can study cougars, but we can also study all of these other species simultaneously. And we will use photos collected at these cameras to develop baseline population estimates for all of these culturally important wildlife species. We can also then use these baseline population estimates for future monitoring, for us to understand whether populations are declining, um, increasing, or staying stable. We can have the tribes set appropriate harvest regulations accordingly, especially for deer and elk. Um, and then also we will be able to compare the cougar and bobcat estimates from cameras to the estimates derived from the stat that we talked about in our first goal. So this is our 2022 camera grid. Um, again, because we have many of the tribes on the peninsula represented in this project, every one of us has our own camera grid. You'll see that the Olympic Peninsula or the Olympic National Park is a bit of a hole. And they are also working with some cameras and camera data. And we are working closely with Olympic National Park. Uh, so we have a large camera grid, well over 400 cameras this year. We deploy them in the spring. We remove them in the fall. And we do this um, with the help of a lot of amazing citizen science, uh, community science volunteers. So we might have some of you on the call tonight. I don't know, but we do have an array of amazing volunteers that go out. Um, every couple of months and check cameras, replace batteries and pull the SD cards and then bring them back to us at the office so we can start getting a sense for whether we're getting the species of interest. And I can tell you right now that yes, unequivocally, these cameras are amazing um, and we get all species of interest. And sometimes we get animals doing amazing things in front of the camera. We get deer sparring. We actually have an entire series of um, a female, a, a doe giving birth to a fawn in front of a camera, which is pretty crazy. Um, we get elk and they're young. We get cougars of all ages. This happens to be a young one. You can see the barring on his or her legs. <clears throat> we get bobcats and their kittens in some instances. We've had cameras where bobcats have been eating a barred owl in front of the camera. It's actually kind of amazing what happens in front of these cameras, especially given that they are actually randomly placed on the environment. We do not select trails to put these cameras on. They are randomly placed. Um, we get lots of bear photos. Sometimes the bears would mess with the cameras and plenty of coyotes as well. So we are getting all species of interest. We're pretty certain that they have no idea that the cameras are ever there, um, especially this one. No idea, just decided that maybe it was gonna start playing with it. So this particular cougar is quite rambunctious. You will see this cat again later. Um, and this little one likes to play with our gear. Um, so as you can imagine, with that many cameras on the landscape, we have a lot of images. So we have collected hundreds of thousands of images. And in order to go through hundreds of thousands of images, that would take a lot of people power um, and a lot of people sitting behind computers. Um, we do do quite a bit of that, but we are also working to train a classifier called Panthera IDS. And this is a classifier that uses artificial intelligence to classify images. It was developed um, by Panthera um, out of South Africa and um, they have created these classifiers for many parts of the world. And we are working on training a classifier for the Pacific Northwest. And what I mean by training that classifier is we feed it hundreds of thousands of images from our area. And then it determine it then, um, sorry, I keep seeing people entering the waiting room. So I got distracted for a moment. Um, so this classifier will ultimately go through and tell us what species are in the photos. This is our goal so that we are not having to do this all on our own. So once we have all hundreds of thousands of our images classified, we will be using a space to event statistical model. Um, and don't worry about that. It's just a new type of statistical model that allows us to estimate population size 
from camera data, which is pretty awesome. So we're hoping to get population estimates again on cougars, bobcats, bear, deer, elk, and coyotes. Um, my employee, Sarah Sendeja Zarelli, who may be on this call, I think I saw her name, um, is kind of the guru of all of this. And she's been working really hard with the statistical um, software to actually start developing population estimates from our camera data. It's really exciting. And then moving on to our third goal, um, which is to understand and examine cougar movements on the Olympic Peninsula, their home ranges, their diets, and most importantly, uh, dispersal patterns of sub-adults as they leave their mothers. <clears throat> so connectivity is a big topic on the Olympic Cougar Project. We know that on the Olympic Peninsula, we are surrounded by water. We are surrounded to the north by the Strait of Juan de Fuca, to the west by the Pacific Ocean, and of course by Puget Sound. Um, and the further south we go, we have the Columbia River, which is quite wide. Uh, and then off of the Olympic Peninsula, in order for anything to get off the peninsula, we have Interstate 5. Uh, so we're interested in understanding how cougars move through this landscape, whether they are able to get off of the Olympic Peninsula or on to the Olympic Peninsula. So we are working with Washington Department um, of Transportation and the um, Washington Wildlife Habitat Connectivity Working Group to actually classify areas or verify areas there where animals may be able to cross highways um, and try to understand with a very future long-term goal of potentially putting an overpass over Interstate 5 for wildlife. And we're looking at a lot of different roads with these groups. On the Olympic Peninsula, not only are we concerned about water and highways, um, we're concerned about overall habitat loss um, as the Olympic Pen Peninsula continues to develop and we continue to see more climate refugees, which I can anticipate will continue to happen as Southern climates uh, in the United States continue to warm. It seems that we will have people moving here to the Olympic Peninsula and wanting small tracts of land. So we need to understand now, um, what are the important dispersal corridors for a keystone species or an umbrella species like a mountain lion? And how does that help all other wildlife? Um, so in order to understand dispersal and how cougars move across the landscape, we do need to capture and put radio collars on them. Uh, so we've been doing this since 2018. And we have on the Olympic Cougar Project captured 85 individual cougars since 2018. Um, the lower Elwha and Quinault have each collared 31 individual cats in Skokomish 23. Uh, we have recaptured many. So we have some animals that have been on the air for many years. We replaced their collars. Some cats have certainly died and we've lost track of some, but we are currently monitoring 42 cougars on the landscape of the Olympic Peninsula. In order to catch cougars, um, we use hounds. We would not be able to do this work without these dogs and without the handlers that work with them. Um, so we owe a lot to these animals. Uh, we go out in the winter and look for cougar tracks. So my crew has been out for the last two days looking for tracks. Unfortunately, we haven't um, caught anything. It seems like the one set of tracks we found was another, was an already collared cougar. Um, but we look for snow tracks when it snows. We also use um, cellular cameras and we use these a lot for when it's not snowing. And we, when we have an animal walk by a camera that's connected to the 3G or 4G network, we are able to get a photo on our phone and then we can go out and try to catch the cougar if we have a cougar walk by. So yes, sometimes in the middle of the night, we're getting pictures of deer and elk and raccoons and everything else. But every so often it is a cougar and then we can go out and attempt to capture it. Um, so we do use the hounds, we do tree the cougars um, and our top priority when we have an animal in a tree is human and animal safety. It's very important to us. So we safely dart the animal, anesthetize it um, and Hopefully the cougar comes down the tree on its own accord. Sometimes we do have to climb for the animals. When we have an animal on the ground, um, we make sure that everybody is safe and that the animal is safe and stable. 
Um, because cougars can get COVID, we actually wear masks on every cougar. Um, we have not seen it on the Olympic Peninsula. We just know that in zoo environments, there are wild cats that have gotten COVID. So we put GPS radio collars on every one of the mountain lions or cougars that we catch. And these um, collars are capable of getting hourly GPS locations. So every hour, these collars um, triangulate with three satellites in space and then a location is recorded. So in the bottom right map here, you will see each individual dot is an individual location of a cougar. On the left is a map that I just downloaded a couple of days ago um, of the last three months of all of our radio collared cougars. Um, this is all the data combined. So where it's red just means there are a lot of individual points in those areas. So you can see that we have the Olympic Peninsula covered quite well um, in order to collect data on cougar movements and dispersal corridors. We are working with um, an AI product called Earth Ranger um, that originally started with the Paul Allen Foundation, I believe. Um, and the Panthera has really developed this piece for us, but it is an amazing program and allows us every morning to come into work it, it sort of brings the data in. We can see where the cougars have been. We can see when cougars are near each other. We can see when individual cougars cross um, park boundaries and highways. And we can see where our crews are on the landscape as well. Um, so here I have a demonstration of what this data really provides for us. So what we're looking at here is you're gonna look for a yellow line that is moving across the landscape. And so I'm gonna hit play. Um, it blends in a little bit with the map, um, but we are monitoring about 30 dispersers. And so what we see here is a dispersing cougar. This is a cat that between 12 and 18 months of year, uh, 18 months old, has left his mother. In this case, it is a male. And we're really seeing a ping pong pattern here. He Look at that. He hits dense human occupied areas and he bounces back. He hits them and then he bounces back. And then you can see this cat goes all the way down to the Columbia River, hits it like a ping pong, bounces back. Um, and then there he goes again. So this cat is trying to find a place to call home. And you can see the constraints of the rivers and the highway if you are a mountain lion on the Olympic Peninsula. Let's see here. Next slide. Um, our colleagues at Panthera have also been really interested in understanding swimming and how far cougars may be able to swim to disperse. We did have one cougar make a one kilometer swim um, down here near Shelton out to this island. It did not make it off that island, but we were really curious to know if it would continue to swim towards Olympia and potentially cross I-5 or cross under I-5. Um, in some areas over there. So um, they have done an analysis looking at what islands might cougars meet, be able to swim to. And can they actually island hop themselves off of the Olympic Peninsula? In just a few areas, might they be able to op island hop off of the Olympic Peninsula? Down here in the far um, south southeast corner, um, maybe up in the Northeast, but they would have to swim a ways in most of these places. So the green indicates places that would be accessible to a swimming cougar. And we do know that they will periodically swim. So what I'm showing here is sort of Bjorn's rainbow. This is a cougar that we call Bjorn. Um, and I decided to just map his data in a, a rainbow of colors to show how far this cat moved every two weeks. So we caught him last February near Quilcene. He spent six months there um, after we captured him with his mother, which is this purple blob. And then he took off. And this is an ama amazing dispersal. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, he, he moved east and then north and then all the way west across the Olympic Peninsula, all the way south and then east again. 
And yes, he made his way into downtown Port Townsend <clears throat> through Port Angeles and up to Nia Bay. And there goes my voice, <coughs> excuse me. And finally, I can stop talking because I'm gonna show you some video from video data. <coughs> um, we get, because we have such focused data on cougars, we are able to see where they are hunting and where they are spending a lot of time. And we are able to then hike in and put cameras on kills or on dens. Um, so we know that mountain lions are ecosystem engineers. They create habitats and they create, they put carrion on the ground, so meat on the ground when they kill, and they feed a lot of other critters in the landscape. It's a really important relationship and we are able to document it often in real time. <clears throat> so when we have um, a kill on the landscape like this, we can often put a camera up and then get video of the cougars coming back and feeding. And this happens to be a really exciting one for us because this is a cat we called Moses feeding an elk on the former Mills Reservoir in the Elwha. So all of our work came together and we could see a cougar using an area that had been inundated because of dams previously. So that's pretty exciting. We are also able to see their behavior at kills. We know we often go in and see these big piles of fur. Uh, we know they don't like to eat it. So this is called shearing behavior. This cougar is pulling the fur <clears throat> off of this deer so that it can then continue to eat. And we get these amazing interactions. There is one species that cougars seem to tolerate on their kills. And Hopefully you can see that one out there. And that is a spotted skunk. When cougars, or excuse me, when bobcats or coyotes come into cougar kills, often they will be killed. But skunks, cougars seem to have understood that they need to tolerate them because they do not want to see this pre-spraying behavior because they know, it seems they know, uh, that that would really mess up their game if they smelled, smelled like a skunk. They learn young. Here is a young cougar who is not really sure what to do about an intruder. But ultimately lets this intruder, intruder stay and feed. And I have to say that is a brazen skunk. I can't actually believe that they will approach cougar kills while the cougar's there. So they clearly have some sort of system worked out where they know to tolerate one another. As I mentioned, um, cougars in a lot of ways are ecosystem engineers. They leave a lot of meat on the ground. They cannot eat a full-sized elk or deer in one city. And so other animals come in when the cougars aren't there and benefit. In this case, we have a bobcat that is benefiting from a cougar kill. Uh, here we have eagles and ravens benefiting from our cougar kill. We've had lots and lots of bald eagles as well as golden eagles on cougar kills. Turkey vultures, of course, always find the cougar kills. The king of the scavengers around here. Here they are drying their wings at a squall. And American black bears. This is the one animal on the Olympic Peninsula that will displace a cougar from a kill. Um, so when we come in, we do look for signs of bears. Cougars, when they kill, they leave really nice little piles and they cover everything up. Well, if a bear comes in, it will just destroy the site and just take body parts everywhere. Um, and we can just always tell when a bear has been there. So we are also able, from the data that we collect, um, we are able to document cougar family groups. And this is pretty exciting. We can see when a female has a den um, with her data and we are able often to get a camera on that den and get behaviors as the animals grow. So I should have warned you about the squealing kittens. Uh, believe it or not, those are those little kittens making that much noise because mom has come back and they are ready to eat. And you can see they are still very, very young and here she is um, moving them about. 
We are also able to watch them be very quiet and cryptic when mom is not there, just trying to keep each other warm um, and dry in the rain. Cougars often den out in more open places than we would have expected. Um, definitely not always down in holes, sometimes just under some ferns. And then we get to watch these animals grow. So when mom leaves them behind, they start to move about. In this case, there were three kittens, but this one is learning to scratch and use its teeth so that slowly it will be able to move about and start hunting with mom, or at least going to kills with mom. Here's an instance of this little one trying to get in on this elk, trying to understand how it is that it can come in and join mom to eat. And then we have these cases of mom eating and kittens coming in. So we've got this very nice, timid little kitten and this very rambunctious sibling. And we think we've seen this sibling before. I believe this is the one that was eating the camera earlier. Um, we actually got a collar on this animal um, a few weeks ago because it's grown much bigger now. And if you listen up, you will find an adult uh, the mother here on the right and her adult young coming in and he, listen up for the noise. I hope that you were able to hear that chirping. Um, you might not have realized that cougars chirp like that, but they do. They have an amazing um, way of communicating with one another. And here we have a mother looking and calling for her kittens at a kill. She's also investigating our camera. Listen up. This is the sound they make when they're looking for one another. And with that, um, I will wrap this up. I have an, we have an amazing crew up here on the North Olympic Peninsula. Um, inclusive the, of the Lower Elwha crew and the Panthera team. This photo does not include all of the other tribal partners on the peninsula, but suffice it to say, we have a lot of amazing folks participating in this project. Um, there's been quite a lot of media attention around the project. Um, interestingly, I just, my slides just stopped advancing again, just in time. Um, I was just going to say that um, we have a there's a lot of media. So if you ever look up the Olympic Cougar Project online and want to know more, CBS Mornings News came out and did a story. Um, Reuters has done a story that got picked up by a couple other news media, the Wild Podcast on KUOW. So if you want to know more, there's plenty. Um, there's plenty more to know. So with that, I can take questions. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Well, Kim, thank you so much for powering through uh, with your with your cold and your illness. Um, I I see the determination that goes into tracking cougars across the Olympic Peninsula carries over into your determination to get this uh, presentation done. So <laughs> it's a lot of work to uh, to track cougars uh, and to follow hounds as they as they chase cougars up and down um, mountainsides and probably um, through some of the um, thickest, uh, densest stands of blackberries and devil's club and everything else, so. You know um, it, we crawl yeah. through nasty stuff, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, you, you make it look easy, and um, but I'm sure uh, I know that it's not, so. Um, we do want to open it up to questions. If you would like to use the chat box, um, the chat feature, you can go ahead. There's also a feature where you can raise your hands, um, your Zoom hand. Um, and uh, if you want to do that, we can call on you as well. So um, I'll start reading out some questions. Um, and then uh, Kim, if you, you want to respond to them, that'd be great. So uh, Carrie wants to know, what's the typical lifespan of a cougar on the Olympic Peninsula? Um, excellent question. We have we have not ever caught a cougar that was much more than eight 
years old. Um, we think they can live on the peninsula to over a decade. We have not, I mean, we've seen some pretty old ones with pretty old teeth, um, but we've never aged one at older than eight. Um, we know they can survive longer than that. We have had just to address the mortality piece. Um, you know, we've had a few cougars die natural deaths. Um, one of our females was killed by another cougar. Um, but the vast majority of the cougars that have died on this project have died prematurely um, at, you know, by humans. So either a little bit of road or getting hit by cars, um, but some hunting mortality, which is legal. Um, and then probably the biggest source of mortality is when cougars um, have a depredation incident on livestock. So it's pretty much a one strike you're out situation with WDFW if a cougar eats um, a domestic animal, then they usually uh, pay with their lives. Okay. So yeah, I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from um, Kathy and it says, uh, do you expect to place cameras in Olympic National Park? Um, that is a great question. Um, Patty Happy, the wildlife biologist for Olympic National Park is doing some camera work. She's done work in various watersheds. Um, we talk frequently um, and work together and hopefully we'll ultimately merge our efforts. But right now we on the Olympic Cougar Project will not be placing cameras, but we are working with the park when and where they place cameras. I do know the parks placed cameras for other projects, especially around fishers, uh, when yes. the fishers were being reintroduced. So um, yeah, great, great question there. And those, Dean, are some of the pictures that we used originally to train that classifier I was talking about was all the camera work from the, the Fisher project. It also looks like uh, from some of your GPS data that the uh, Elwha Low Divide corridor is a very popular cougar route Yeah, <laughs> uh, from looking there kind of makes me think about my backpacking plans. <laughs> All right, um, Dan asks, are the genetic analysis used for presence absence or is there enough information to study um, gene flow and or population evolution? Great question. Um, excellent question. Um, it is for more than presence absence. Um, you no, know, at minimum it's for presence absence. Sometimes we can only get to species level um, on the genetic analysis, if the genetics aren't sort of high, highest of highest enough quality, um, but we are look, we are identifying individual animals, which will us, allow us to look at parentage and family groups, um, and then compare um, some of that to off peninsula populations. So evolution is that was that part of the question? I feel like I can look at the question here. Um, over time that we will, time will tell with if we can get our hands on some genetic samples from elsewhere. Um, but right now we are mostly looking at gene flow for sure um, and relatedness. Okay. All right, um, hopefully that answers Dan's question. Um, if not, Dan, go ahead and do some follow-up in the chat there. Um, Teresa Morrow wants to know, are cougars a danger to hikers and others in the park? Excellent question. Um, always the one that people want to know. Um, I will quote another biologist uh, in Washington who says that, who said after the attack in Snoqualmie a few years ago, which is extraordinarily rare, that it is improbable that a cougar will attack a person, but it is not impossible. Um, I will say that I used to fear cougars a lot more than I do now. Um, we see their data. We quite frankly see how frequently they are close to humans and human trails and humans rarely see them. A lot of humans saw Bjorn actually um, on his traverse across the peninsula and he was never a threat. I know, we know from experience that we frequently walk in to areas where we know that the cougars are and they always leave. They do not want to tangle with humans. They really don't. They are more afraid of us than we are of them. Um, so I do not think that you need to fear cougars being a danger in the park. Having said that, it is wise to acknowledge that they are there and that they can attack. It is unlikely that they will, but if it is something you know that a person is concerned about, it is good to hike in groups. 
And there is, we do believe that pepper spray would definitely work to stave off an attack and also know what to do. Know to make yourself look big, you know, to throw rocks, um, make noise and let that animal know that you need mean business. So I hope that has allayed some concerns. You know, I am not terribly concerned about cougars attacking people, but it, it could happen, but it is not something, it is not a reason to not go hiking. Okay, um, great advice and what the park rangers um, tell our, um, our visitors as they're hiking in cougar country. So um, yeah, if you're, if you're hiking with, uh, with uh, small family members, it's always good to make sure that they don't run off ahead of you uh, on trails so, as well. So yeah. um, Michael Dawson asks, can the public see Yorn's track on a map? Um, no, um, that is a good question. We often don't, don't show their data, but because he's moved so far and so wide, I felt like I could show it without endangering him. Um, but in general, we do not share the data because we do not want to endanger the animals. There are people that would use it to find the animals, um, and for, you know, for hunting purposes. So, Unfortunately, that, is, that, that, that kind of data is not something that we, we ordinarily share, um, but I chose to share, share his because it's such a phenomenal movement and he did it so quickly, you know, those two week chunks uh, that I didn't feel like sharing his would endanger him. I hope that helps answer the question. Great. Um, Nathalie uh, Summers asks, how do you volunteer for some of the projects? Um, excellent question. Uh, you can email me if you if anybody has a pen. Um, my and it, what is on the next slide that I can't get to, um, but my email address is kim dot sager s a g e r at l y dot org, um, and we can then um, I can pass that information along to Sarah um, because where we really use volunteers is for the cameras and not. Okay. Else of the work. Sarah beat me to it. She she typed it in the chat there. So thank you, Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> She's right. Um, and then Lee asked, there was a slide showing dispersal of the cougar, and it looked like lower southwest Washington was empty near Long Beach South and from Ocean Highway. Um, from the ocean to the highway. Any speculation as to why? Is that I think outside that is, of the project area or? Yeah, that's outside the project area. I think that's just a function of where we have animals collared. I don't think that's like a, a lack of cougars in that area. Um, I just think that the ones that we have collared haven't dispersed there. That would be my guess. All right. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and address a question that was sent directly to me. Um, okay. That I, only I can see because other people yeah. might have this question. And the question is, have you killed or injured cougars during collaring? No. Uh, people are concerned about that. I totally get it. Um, we have not had that happen. In the 85 animals that we have captured, not one of them has been injured. And we are very proud of that fact. Um, and so I just am going to put that out there to the whole group. We are very uh, conscientious about animal welfare. We've taken a lot of training um, to ensure the safety of the animals and the safety of the drug that we use and the safety of our methods. So yeah, thank you. Um, this is a follow-up from Dan from the previous question about genetics. Okay. And, and he's asking, what are the genetic markers used? Mitochondria or an SNP panel, et cetera? Mitochondrial. Okay. And if he wants to email me, I can put him in touch with Cameron, who is the geneticist on the project, who's the PhD mm -hmm. student at the University of Idaho, who's doing all that work. Great. Yeah, but we've talked about doing the SMPs um and have not yet but he i'm happy to talk to him more about that okay um logan uh, is stating i've heard that black bear populations are extraordinarily large on the peninsula in tens of thousands is this true what? does no. this match your experience in seeing them recording them no not tens, tens of thousands. thousands uh no uh, I did my, my graduate work studying bears on the Olympic Peninsula in the Elwha. Um, no, we, you know, we got genetics in the Elwha from 
over a little over 30, um, which again is not indicative of the entire population. Um, but we do not have an incredibly large population of black bears. I mean, we have a healthy population of black bears. Um, no, tens of thousands would be bonkers. We would be all have them in our living rooms probably. Um, but I'm glad you asked. Yes, so we're debunking yep. some some uh, um, false information. There. there are not tens of thousands of bears. On the right. Great. Right. Um, and then uh, Darcy asks, cougars and bobcats don't bury their scat like house cats. Question mark. Do they um, or do they not? Well, they don't exactly bury it, but they do scrape near it often. So often they will poop in a scrape. So they will, they, and it's not always covering the scat, but they often do do a, a scrape with their paw where they, um, where they defecate. Okay. But they don't then, cover it. Okay. Uh, and then a, the a second question from Darcy is, um, she's interested in knowing why people were holding fawns uh, in the pictures. <laughs> Yeah. Although um, they're, they're very cute, so. Good question. Yes, because we're stuck on this slide, aren't we? Uh, we historically <laughs> had, we have done five years of studying fawn mortality. And that happens to be when we were taking photos, when we were catching fawns. So we spent five years putting little radio transmitting collars on uh, deer fawns, expandable that grow with them. And so every spring for five years, we would go out and find fawns, quickly handle them, put these little expanding radio collars on them, and then document them for an entire year to see what fawn survival is over the course of a year. And some of this led us to some of our cougar research because we know that um, you know, bears, cougars, bobcats do prey on fawns. Um. Karen Bacco asks, are there any current human-made wildlife crossings on the Olympic Peninsula? No. Nope. We have just the one in Washington. Um, on at, Snoqualmie. It, at Snoqualmie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a pretty impressive um, to drive underneath that crossing. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, pretty massive uh, engineering, um, piece of engineering on the highway there. Yeah. So, um, is there data on the effectiveness of that one on snow quality? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't actually, I haven't followed that. I know mm. that they've put cameras out there and I know animals are using it, but I don't know numerically. I'm not sure like numbers that are crossing. Hmm. Okay. And Maybe you know, California, I don't know if people know that California is building a really big one as well um, in the LA, the greater LA area, because those cougars are really in trouble as far as population bottlenecks like it's actually awesome. insane to me that cougars live where they live in southern california because of the traffic and the highways down there so they need absolutely it. Yeah. yeah all right um well i think i've i've covered every of the questions in the chat and i don't see any i, I haven't seen anybody raise their uh, their hand um, to ask a question. So I think I'm going to give everyone uh, another minute. Do my very best to use my teacher skill of accepting silence. <laughs> All right, not quite a minute, I couldn't do it. So Kim, I just wanted to say thank you so much um, for this presentation. It was really just incredible. And um, the work that you and the partners and all of your team um, that are out there doing is just in, is fabulous. And um, the understanding that we're getting of cougars and how they um, use the, use the peninsula and the landscape, um, just really fascinating stuff. So thank you so much. Um, you. We are um, pleased to be able to offer you an honorarium through um, our um, 
partners, the Discover Your Northwest, who run our bookstores. So um, thank you for your time. And we're also going to be able to give you, I don't know if you can see this, but this water bottle will be coming your way as well. So thank you so much um, for your time and for toughing it out with your with your cold. Um, you did a yes, and thank you job. for the water bottle. My husband came home with one and I was really jealous and I've been trying Yeah, well, to this one it. will be, this will be yours. <laughs> so um, thanks everybody for coming tonight um, and we will see you hopefully um, on December 13th at 7 p.m when Dr. Kathy um, Trost from uh, UW um, presents on the geologic mysteries of Rialto Beach. So we're gonna go from cougars to geology um, here. So thanks everyone and have a great night. <laughs>